Assalamu alaikum dear viewers, peace be upon you all. Welcome to our show on Imam Hussain TV discussing different aspects of the story of Ashura that took place in Karbala. Today we'll be discussing the very important topic of intention or in Arabic niyyah. The intention is something that's very highly emphasized in Islam and you see it very much present as a topic on the day of Ashura in the Battle of Karbala. To discuss this issue and uh, shed some light upon it. We have our esteemed guest today, we've got Sheikh Ali Maash joining us, Sayyid uh, Mohsin Shah, Imran Datu, and Tahir Abdul to help out with some poetry as well. Sheikh, to begin with, when we look at uh, the Battle of Karbala, it clearly is a group of people with good intentions versus a group of people with evil intentions. But the actions are almost the same, they are fighting each other in battle in a sense. But before we get to this, what was the intention of the Imam going to Kufa and for the uprising in the first place? A dua from Imam al Sajjad with regard to the intention, he mentions in his dua. وأعني على صالح النية ومرضي القول ومستحسن العمل. The Imam عليه السلام he asks Allah سبحانه وتعالى to bless him with honest intention. صالح القول صالح النية. Of course to start anything in Islam we just give this uh, foundation for. Uh, the topic of in intention that in Islam every movement, every act needs intention. Of course there are acts they don't need any intention that say if, if you want to purify an impure then you just wash it and then you go to do the wudu or, or the ghusl and so forth. Um, but with regard to the intention you have to have the intention uh, for the acts of uh, worship with regard to the contracts let's say marriage contract, you must have the intention of, of marrying the, uh, uh, the, uh, the one who you're proposed for. And likewise for the buying and selling and so forth, to have this intention of buying and, and selling. It's not just a uh, mock buying or selling. So intention is one of the bases of Islam within uh, the ibadat and contracts. Um, so the Imam Salamullah mentions that honest intention is the first step for the one to move towards his goal and objectives and then satisfying speech, in other words, to satisfy and please Allah SWT with the right speech and words and statements and more desirable acts and good acts, in other words. وَمُسْتَحْسَنُ amal. So the more good deeds, then that is what is favorable and, and required. I don't want to go through the meaning of niya in the Arabic language, uh, but in overall, um, the movement of human being should be towards Allah SWT and not just towards uh, materials of this world, unlike um, those who are non-religious, who only think about raising money and um, gaining more power and so forth. There's a hadith from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi with this regard. He says, very famous hadith, إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَّاتِ وَإِنَّمَا لِكُلِّ مْرَئِمْ مَا نَوَى All the a'mal, all the deeds begins with intention. And whatever you intend for, you go for that intention, with, the, with that intention. Then the Holy Prophet he goes and elaborates. He says, فَمَنْ كَانَتْ هِجْرَتُهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ The one who had the intention of uh, migrating towards Allah and his Holy Prophet, فَهِجْرَتُهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ This migration is for the cause of Allah and for the cause of the Prophet وَمَنْ كَانَتْ هِجْرَتُهُ إِلَى دُنْيَا يُصِيبُهَا If his intention was to achieve something, to get something from this dunya only. So purely materialistic. Or to, let's say, migrate from the US to the UK, or from the UK to Australia, yeah. 
you know, he's, he met somebody on, on the net, for example. He wants to marry that individual. So only for that purpose. He says, فَهِجْرَتُهُ إِلَى مَا هَاجَرْ إِلَيْهِ This migration and movement is based on his intention. Is it for the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Then he gets dunya and akhirah. Only for dunya, then only for dunya. Imam al Hussein salamu alayhi. He made it clear from the first day of his movement from and uh, migration from uh, Medina to Mecca and Mecca to uh, Karbala. He said it clearly to those who they tried to advise the Imam alayhi salam that you're going towards Iraq, those who betrayed your father Ali alayhi salam and killed him, and then your uh, brother Hassan alayhi salam. The Imam responded that. إني لم أخرج أشرا ولا بطرة وإنما خرجت لطلب الإصلاح في أمة جد رسول الله صلى الله عليه وآله that I revolted I came out wasn't for a purpose of pride or wickedness or um, fame but I came out and revolted for the purpose of reformation in the um, the nation of my grandfather, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, reformation, islah, talab al-islah. Mm. The intention of the imam was to reform the community and the society of Muslim after it was deviated from the true path of Allah and his prophet and Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam. After what Bani Umayyad did, um, the like of Muawiyah and Yazid and so forth, who, who came and distorted Islam and deviated the Islam from its right uh, path. And of course, another statement in Ziyarat al Arba'in we read as well that the Imam says to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that وَبَذَلَ مُهْجَتُهُ فِيك that Imam al Hussein alayhi salam gave his soul. Now, the muhja in Arabic means the blood which resists in, in, in the heart, hmm. resides in the heart, the blood of the heart. He gave it away, and of course, if you give the blood of your heart, means death. Yeah. You know, if, if I give my blood of my vein, then I won't die. But as soon as, uh, let's say, the arrow or the, uh, the bullet reaches the, the heart and the blood gushes out from the heart, then the one dies instantly. So the Imam alayhi, gave the blood of his heart and his soul for what purpose? What intention was in the Imam's mind? To save the people from ignorance وحيرت الضلال and the um, misguidance as well. So you have ignorance and misguidance. Mm. So the Imam Salaam Allah established Karbala, went to Karbala to save the humanity from ignorance and misguidance. That was his intention Salaam Allah and he achieved of course. Mm. And branching up this, Sayyid Mohsin, just to pose the question, let's say for example you and I both we both do the same action. We both, for example, donate to a food bank or something. I do it because I would like a few likes on Instagram, whereas you do it for the sake of God. We both done the same thing. We both help the food bank. Why in Islam is your superior to mine? Well, first of all, you know the, the intention kind of like dictates, um, you know, what you're going to do and why you're going to do it. Now, if you're going for you know, Instagram likes, that's clearly that's, you know, you're trying to show off a little bit here. Um, your intention, your heart is not in the right place. But whereas if someone, an individual has, you know, the best interest of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not just the best interest of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but also like humanity and then to help someone, that, you know, you know, one day that might be me that, you know, needs, needs help uh, if we're going to, go to a food bank. So if I can give mm. and, and help, why not? And our religion is, is, is you know, charity is one of the most... Um, you know, promoted uh, you know, aspects of our, of our belief. So, mine would be worth seen more valuable um, in the eyes of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala mm. because of the sincerity behind the act. Mm. Um, Dahir and Imran, you both travel around the world, invited to recite poetry, and it'd be interesting to ask you: How do you keep your intention as pure as possible? Because I know, with both your reputations, you get a lot of praise. I'm sure from the people around you that listen to you, and, and rightfully so. But how, how are you able to keep your intention purely for, for the sake of God and for the sake of the Imam, um, versus maybe 
trying to get the intention of becoming more well known, for example. How do you how do you psychologically deal with this? I think it's definitely a constant struggle. So first you've got the state of mind. So most of the cases when we prepare poetry, whether it's writing or reciting, we prepare it out of the seasons of sadness. So for instance, the Ashura poetry, I write them two, three months before. Yeah. Uh, so now we're in a situation where we're cheerful, we're getting on with our daily lives and how do we get into a state of mind where our intentions are pure and not pure just in the right frame of mind to write about mm. Ashura justly, to reflect the, the struggles and, and the tragedy itself uh, and to serve Mahfizan, uh, the Ahl Bayt and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mm. as a whole um, in a just manner and through pure, uh, with a pure intention. Uh, so if we go back to the very beginning is getting that right frame of mind and once you've got the right frame of mind there's also the ego thing uh, everybody's got an ego uh, poets reciters yeah. they tend to have the biggest egos at times <laughs> uh, so finding where your ego takes over and eliminating it i think that's uh, probably mm. the key here so with me is when i'm writing i'm thinking rah that's a bar like, I'm, <laughs> thinking, I'm not thinking of you know serving my sin at that point i'm thinking of the praise I'm going to get because of that. So understanding that your wordplay isn't for you mm. uh, or for the people, it's for you know propagating the message yeah. and you know di you know separating yourself from your ego in that manner. Yeah. Uh, it's a constant struggle. So we mm. have to suffer it every year when we're writing, every year when we're reciting. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I think also to follow on um, when it comes to an intention, it's more. Um, I think if you work backwards. Sometimes, so if you uh, look at the act that you're going to do, for example, in our case, if you're going to recite, um, how do you want that recitation to come across, or why are you actually reciting? So, you know, if you look at the actual act itself, and you think that, you know, what, I'm, when I'm doing the know-how and I'm reciting the latnam, I'm reciting it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa taala, for Imam, uh, for say the Zahra example. Um, so with that, if you work backwards, say if I want my recitation to come across purely for them. That means my intention when I'm reciting has to be nothing, nothing but mm. just for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And uh, however, on the other hand, if you said like, you know, oh, I want to be more well known, yeah. I want to do this. And I, like if you go to certain communities, there's, um, you know, there's a there's a way to particularly recite anaha to pick up the beat, to pick yeah. up the anaha beat, for example. Um, and if you and sometimes it's good to kind of get the um, atmosphere going for that, so you know more grief is uh, uh, rises. However, if you do it so that they say, "Oh, I hope I do it to satisfy the people, mm. so that they call me again next year," so I do it particularly for them. Then that's way well, you know. Then if that's your intention, then you're going to recite it. Like you're going, your preparation is going to be totally different, mm -hmm. totally different. So it like working backwards also helps. So, uh, so sometimes and like um, Tahir said, like ego, everybody has an ego. It's difficult, like especially if you get invitations here, there, and everywhere. I think Hadiyah is a popular um, uh, problem as well. Like you know, um, you know, may Allah protect us from all this. But you know, if you start, if the communities start giving you this much, this much, this much. You know, God forbid you you go for the money and you yeah. say, "Oh, this person's paying me the most. I'm going there." Um, you know that can that can be a big uh, issue as well. Maybe so that you, that stuff should be a byproduct rather than the absolutely, aim. absolutely, yeah. So that like um, you know, again, it depends on each individual reciter what and you know, everyone's circumstances is different. But yeah, the main main thing should be like you know, you're doing it for Imam Hussein for said as for Allah subhanahu wa taala because if you are going to gain any respect in this world, even if you even if, even if you don't have the best voice, you will still rise above that person who has the most amazing voice because of your intention. Yeah. Yeah. So. True, yeah. And a constant reminder that the gifts and talents you have don't belong to you. Yeah, exactly. And, and mm -hmm. you have to remind yourself. Yeah, yeah. exactly right. I mean, yeah. Sheikh, is it um, just branching on from their discussion? Do, is it possible to have a dual, in, uh, two intentions at once, but both are good? So, for example, I'll, I'll put it to you. Let's say I have uh, the intention to please God but also to please people and maybe to get famous but that fame will bring you more opportunities to inspire other people and get them close to God Islamically, is having a double intention possible or should it solely be for the sake of God only? You have to look at the goal and the aim and objective if it ends at the, uh, the end of this aim and this intention is for the pleasing Allah SWT, that's fine so be it, you know, if you want to become a, a famous uh, reciter, for example, lecturer. Yeah. At the end of the day, you want to serve Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You want to serve Ahl Bayt, 
So go for it, work for it. And we need, we need people with uh, great capabilities that they can perform better and basically uh, offer better service in terms of uh, the know-how and the recitation and even lecture for the community. So, mm. of course. Mm. That's Absolutely, right. it's very uh, interesting. Um, as per the format of the show, we are going to have a short poem by Brother Tahir that will um, describe or reflect upon an aspect of Ashura, um, as is the format of the show. So please, uh, Brother Tahir, if you don't mind, please recite some poetry for us and for the audience at home. Uh, so this poem is called Ten Days and it's specifically written uh, for the topic of intention. Uh, so you have to get bear with me because it's a very new poem. It starts us with Ten Days, Here We Are. Another year, another 10 days added to our collection. But what do they mean? And what do they mean to a person like me, a person like you? What do these 10 days mean to someone, someone who lives life comfortably, flowing through life uninterrupted, except for tiny hiccups? What do these 10 days mean to others who aren't living as comfortably as us? People who have had lofty aspirations, scattered loved ones that once mattered, dreams dispersed, waking up to mornings of hunger and sleepless nights of thirst. Each person living through their own blessing and curse. But the question still arises, what do these 10 days mean to a person like me, a person like you or a person like him or her? This question is not a new one. This question was asked on that se very same day, a day where we had 72 names, 72 people, 72 stories, 72 past, present and futures, all brought to one conclusion, one cause, one message, under one banner, under one leader, who'd done it all for the one. And the beauty of it all was that it wasn't rehearsed. These individuals made the decision knowing it cannot be reversed. Some had only moments to decide, yet it took, to them it was unbelievably clear. To leave them behind or to disappear or to pick up a sword, armour, a spear. Most people who fight against the odds do not fight out of choice. They are given no choice. Yet these 72 individuals did not see the odds and flee. They saw the difference between being shackled and free, earth and its numbered days, or martyrdom and its eternal glory. These people stopped pointing at their battered hearts, stopped holding on to the jewels of life, the spouses, the mothers, the fathers, the sons and daughters. They removed the attachments of life from their shoulders and surrendered it all to him. How many of us can even contemplate reaching that point with only moments to consider? And that's the difference between any other written story because hearts, unlike pages, expand infinitely. And for him, 72 hearts were sacrificed that day, each with their own journey, each with their own story, each with their own legacy, each capturing our hearts year upon year, forming a fire in the hearts of believers that will never extinguish. But how could this be? How could this possibly be to understand? Let's look at astronomy. In astronomy, there is a phenomenon called the stellar collision, where two stars collide and merge in submission, forming an object infinitely brighter, lighting up the universe like a flick of a light. It's said that this happens once every 10,000 years. And more so, more than two stars colliding at once is, just not, is, is not just rare, but virtually impossible, yet 72 dared that day where God decided to make true the promise of sacrifice. Unlike Abraham, who like a phoenix from the ashes would rise. Unlike Jesus from the crucifix veiled before human eyes. Unlike Ishmael's throat saved and from this we flock to our pilgrimage. Hussein's throat was maimed, paraded with 72 heads on the spear. And as a result, we have a bridge where a tear in hell will overwhelm, worth more weight than an ocean held, where a walk to his shrine is worth more than a thousand planetary swells. So I, here I am asking what these 10 days mean to me, but instead I should be asking what I mean to them. Look at me, I'm lucky if I even live to 22. So how lucky were they to die as his 72? SubhanAllah. Brilliant poem. Much to reflect on, especially with the regards to intention. Thank you so much. Um, just to bring the discussion slightly forward and draw to even a close, um, Sheikh, the intention and purifying it, just for our viewers, we talked about the theory of it. In terms of practical advice, how do we purify our intentions in terms of, is it something we have to struggle with? I mean, 
So I spoke about this struggle between the ego versus you know, serving God. So how would you practically advise our viewers and us here in the studio today, how do we practically purify attention? Do we have to stop each time we do an act in a sense and revisit why we're doing these things or are there other ways that Islam advises? As I've mentioned uh, just recently in the dua of Imam Sajjad alayhi salam that the Imam asks Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he gives him um, the honest intention. So initially we ask Allah, the Almighty, to give us and uh, to bestow this intention, which is a, a purified intention from any kind of attachments of this world. Uh, so we ask Allah initially as in the dua and practically we try to disassociate anything else with our intention. So solely and only for the purpose of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, nothing else. I try my best to um, offer this service, either as a noha, as a majlis, eulogy, uh, yeah. even walk towards the Imam alayhi salam in Arba'in for the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So intention plus practically I try to implement that in the real world uh, that I don't associate any, anything else with it. Mm. I think um, one thing that I try to um, practice myself that, that helped with this is, I'm, I'm sure you guys may agree, that w we know that the 11th Imam says one of the signs of a believer is they say Bismillah loudly. Mm -hmm. And I think even a mundane action, if you say in the name of Allah just before doing it, even an act of sitting down, drinking water, even resting, can become a godly act because your intention is, is there for... Uh, have, you had, have you had occasions where you are doing a mundane act and you just think actually this can become a godly act just by saying in the name of God. Do you, do you have you had moments where you switch to intention because it could be a godly intention? Definitely all the time I guess like even if it's going out to work. Exactly. You know you know gaining a risk is, is you know a form of ibadah. Because so. some people, I, uh, I totally agree with you here, I think some people who, who work very hard and uh, have very long hours they could get accused of being worldly people but in fact, if they do it with the intent of seeking sustenance to worship God, to provide for their family, as the Imams have taught us, it's an act of worship. So, absolutely right there. Indeed, um, I, think, I think that's fair to say with any action, you can flip it over, mm. you know, and you can, you can change your intention to, you know, benefit yourself, benefit your Iman, benefit the community, and also gain in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, definitely. Yeah. How, how, what about you, Imran? Is there any times where you've had to rethink your intention because um, it was a normal act you were doing and then you could have made a better act just by the intention? Yeah, absolutely. I think there are, um, there are times, um, I think well, you'll find that especially maybe maybe at a low time in your life, because obviously everyone goes through tests, mm -hmm. everybody has yes. trials, tribulations, um, and especially at a low time, um, say for example, I don't know, you didn't get your results, mm. you're feeling very low, you didn't get a job, etc, etc. That's when uh, it's a test, so you're supposed to connect to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even more there. So even going about your day-to-day -day actions during that low period, you will probably be more in the zone with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So any act that you do, automatically you will feel, you know, something like even if you get a glass of water, for mm. example, you will be like, hang on, there are other people in the house. Let me ask them. Mm. Just something small. Sure. And we even like, like we're, we're, I mean, uh, the example is great because even we're on Imam Hussein TV, if we drink a glass of water and then send peace on the Imam afterwards to remember his thirst, a small act of quenching your own thirst becomes a salutation upon the Imam. Sense, and what, yeah. a, what, a be what a better way. Yeah. Uh, before we close this out, Sheikh, if you could give maybe some final words of advice or some closing words on the intention before we get to um, the eulogy. The Holy Quran mentions, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Inna ma yataqabbalu Allah min al-muttaqin. Allah would accept only from uh, those who are pious and observe piety. Mm. So intention and having piety, observing piety is very important. So having taqwa, which relates to the intention as well, to have the right and the good intention as I mentioned, would result in pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his Prophet and Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam and eventually the one who would gain uh, the rewards that he needs with the hereafter. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, our dear viewers, for joining us on this show. The clear message is very, very apparent that the intention is the foundation of every act of Islam. And the intention of the Imam was so pure, which is the reason why he is remembered still today. And it was beautifully mentioned that two people can do the same action, but the one who does it with the best intention to please God and get close to God 
is the one that remains forever. We're going to close with our eulogy as per usual, as the format of the show dictates. And we would like to invite uh, Brother Imran Datu for this. Excellent, thank you. So just um, uh, before I start, the uh, poem is about, again, uh, how Imam Hussein he had this intention of, you know, going to Karbala, knowing, uh, you know, he was going to face his death, but keeping that intention purely for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this poem is, um, it's as uh, said, the Zahra speaking to mm. her son, Imam Hussein alayhi yes. salam. In your final moments, the ground shakes with agony and pain see your mother is by your side with every piece of me i have brought you up now to pieces i have seen you fall you have seen too much your lord now calls you come my thirsty broken son come Hussein, oh my Hussein, your back lay on the burning sands and your lips thirsty and dry as they draw closer to you. My son, I am always with you. Jibreel descends from the sky too, and you know that I'm here with you. Oh, my Hussein, oh, my Hussein, how can I stand and watch you fall? How can I? see you all alone as my ribs broke back then now oh. my heart to pieces fall and i cry out to my father to see how my son they torture you oh my Hussein, oh my Hussein, I was with you when Abbas did fall, when to his master he did call, oh my master Hussein. Come to my aid, come to my aid. How will the brothers meet with no arms? How will Abbas embrace? Oh, my Hussein, oh, my Hussein, oh, my Hussein. Oh, my Hussein, your sister Zainab will now see your broken, headless body, your head upon the spears does rise for her to see, and in chains they shackle the queen for her. Brother Hussein, oh my Hussein, oh my Hussein, oh my Hussein.